Right. Hello, my name is Jonathan Gertz. I'm a senior project manager with Keystone Policy Center, and uh, I wanted to thank the organizers for welcoming uh, me to join you today uh, on a webinar to talk about the emerging space of voluntary climate markets. Uh, this is a presentation that they heard me present for the first time at the Sustainable Agriculture Summit a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I've added a little bit to it, and I hope you find it instructive. So clearing up climate market confusion. Off, who's Keystone Policy Center? Uh, Keystone was founded in 1975. Uh, we tend to find ourselves uh, as a third party in multi-stakeholder dialogues. Uh, we kick open uh, uh, big uh, collaborative dialogues, coalitions, things like Field the Market on agricultural metrics, like the Honeybee Health Coalition, like Farmers for, Mar for Monarchs uh, on pollinator work. Uh, we work in agriculture and education, natural resources, tribal engagement, uh, and we really aim for collective impact. Uh, our dialogues take a number of forms. And in the case of, uh, of this, we're, we set up a pre-competitive industry dialogue. But first, what's the contest for, context for agricultural carbon? At the moment, uh, as we learned from the Paris Agreement, it was, as is coded in the Paris Agreement, uh, natural climate solutions are needed to reduce uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. They're especially important part of the whole equation for, for lowering greenhouse gases because they provide a near-term solution, something that can be done now, something that can be done without, uh, with the technology we already have, and with the organic systems that are already in need of being improved. Uh, in addition, they have all kinds of uh, complementary benefits that we already know. Uh, in efforts to sequester carbon and efforts to reduce greenhouse gases on agricultural lands, uh, we also end up conserving and restoring those lands. Uh, so it just makes sense uh, from that perspective. Market-based programs have emerged uh, in different spaces around carbon. Uh, with the attempt to align the profit with good practice. Uh, however, it's a challenging space. Uh, it's been difficult for agriculture to get a toehold uh, and establish protocols with the existing regulatory markets that are available for, for energy providers um, due, to, due to stringent requirements and appropriate requirements from, from carbon registries. Uh, these include uh, the need to have strict accounting systems making sure that uh, multiple programs are not trying to do the same thing on the same acreage and pay twice for the same effect. Uh, additionality, uh, the requirement that, um, that anything that, that is done uh, with these programs be something that, that couldn't be done without these programs and without these payments. Uh, and requirements of permanence, uh, uh, aiming for uh, carbon that is stored, carbon that is reserved, emissions that are reduced uh, to be for the long term and not just immediately be re-released into the atmosphere as a result of the programs. Uh, these are especially challenging in agricultural systems, uh, especially in, in terms of soil carbon, uh, because especially in tilled systems, uh, you get turnover of the soil every year. And I'll let, uh, I'll let my counterpart, uh, Dr. Anna uh, Cates, who's also on this, on this webinar, uh, talk more about the uncertain, uncertainties regarding soil carbon sequestration. Uh, but it's been difficult to meet these requirements uh, because they're meant for more industrial systems. And really, uh, some of the only agricultural protocols that have been able to enter into some of the regulatory systems have been around methane capture and reuse in livestock systems, because that's something that's easier to measure, easier to quantify, uh, and also more permanent, easier to prove permanence on that. Uh, so in the absence of being able to participate easily in regulatory markets have emerged dozens of voluntary market-based programs. Uh, and these have focused on carbon, carbon sequestration, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, including, including CO2, uh, nitrous oxide and methane uh, and other ecosystem services, trying to return payments to the farmers for things that they're already doing uh, and things that they, they do in order to benefit their, their land. Um, because they can't, uh, uh, they by and large have, have, are still figuring out their roles regarding some of these registry requirements. Uh, these entities have 
a, a number of different strategies for reducing uncertainty and reducing the risk associated with, with these new market um, protocols. Uh, since the space is new, uh, it's emerged in the last handful of years. It does currently have less, uh, less governmental, less regulatory oversight than more mature industries. Uh, and there's guidance that's still pending, that's being developed. Uh, the greenhouse gas protocol is developing guidance for, for land sector uh, uh, guidance. Uh, Climate Smart Commodities Program has been developed by the USDA in order to test out a number of different interventions, including, including market-based strategies. And as we all know, the Farm Bill is coming out shortly, and that could also change some of the regulations in this space. Uh, to try to be proactive about that, uh, Keystone uh, and others uh, convened the Agricultural Climate Markets Collaborative. Uh, it's a membership-based group. It's a, it's a pre-competitive industry dialogue, uh, voluntary membership to try to identify pre-competitive actions that can create more transparency, build trust in the marketplace, uh, ensure that actors don't enter the marketplace trying to find the competitive niche of undercutting credibility, uh, and trying to provide more consistent, reliable feedback to protocol bodies such as the registries, uh, the USDA and others, as these programs that I mentioned are being developed as this guidance is being uh, developed uh, with the overall goal of just making it a clearer marketplace, easier to participate in, uh, easier and more clear benefits generated from it. Some of the first actions uh, that the collaborative has, has done include creating a set of voluntary pre-competitive principles, and I'll go through these, the principles for transparency. Uh, and we've also engaged with, with other stake, stakeholders in other, in other sectors, such as growers, the registries, supply chain actors, uh, and the USDA in order to make sure that we're, uh, we're not proceeding blind to the, to the, uh, the overall ecosystem that, that we're uh, participating in. Here's some of the actual members. Uh, the program developers, developers of market-based solutions. Uh, some of them are long-established, large uh, agribusinesses in the space. Some of them are more startup uh, efforts. Uh, some of them are more, even more community-based efforts. Uh, but together, they represent a wide range of approaches uh, to market-based market -based climate solutions. Uh, in addition to the developers, we have a collection of of NGOs uh, that are providing insight into the protocol space, uh, into some of the other conversations that are happening and advising the effort. <clears throat> so the principles for transparency that was the first major product of the group, uh, why were they produced? Uh, first off, conclusion that climate solutions for ag would not reach scale. Uh, unless those who participate in these market-based solutions have the ability to make informed decisions uh, regarding their participation. Uh, one of the challenges in this space is just trying to figure out who the players are and what all their different rules are and, um, and, and what their contract requirements will be. Uh, and so grouping them together in one place, making standards for, for the kinds of information that should be available was a key first step for this group. Uh, second off, uh, having agreed upon principles for transparency uh, will assist with greater industry credibility. Again, as I mentioned, making sure that actors don't enter, uh, enter the space, trying to undercut standards in order to, uh, in order to be competitive and making sure that carbon markets re retain a good name. And thirdly, uh, since the marketplace is evolving, it's a very evolving space, lots of actors in it. Uh, these principles are just a first step. Uh, that we hope they're a step in the right direction, but our conversations, our ongoing conversations with other sectors, we hope will generate more momentum uh, and help the space to, to seek more, more standardization uh, uh, and greater credibility. <clears throat> so these principles for transparency are published at this, uh, this website that's, uh, that's at the Keystone website. I'll flash up a QR code later on. But I just wanted to run down through them. Uh, there's 11 of them, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, and, uh, and again, the main purpose is just to make sure that the growers and others who are participating with these voluntary market providers have what they need in order to make smart decisions, uh, in order to know what they're getting into uh, with some of these contracts. First off, 
just basic information. Am I eligible for these programs? Uh, it it's, uh, can be really difficult, or at least it has been until now, difficult to figure out which programs are even applied to you in your geography, with your production system, with your land use type, uh, and with what other programs that you may be enrolled in. Contract ob ob obligations. This is basic stuff. How long is my contract? If I sell my land, will, how will the contract be, uh, uh, be transferred to other landowners? Uh, what happens if I can't fulfill the contract for whatever reason? Asset types, what's going to be generated from my practices? I'm going to be improving practices. Uh, and then how are they turned into assets? How are they turned into units of carbon, units of uh, ecosystem services and other things that will be sold and traded in these markets? Uh, standards, uh, yeah, what standards and protocols do you use? Basically, how do you ensure that you're a credible uh, participant in this space? Uh, they should be able to provide that answer. Uh, data requirements and uncertainty. How many times am I going to be asked to, to provide what kind of data? And can you just plug into my John Deere tractor and have that be the data that I provide? Um, and you know, what's, what's going to be the burden uh, associated with that? Uh, models, what models are being used and, uh, and the underlying assumptions and data sets within them. Uh, you know, there's going to be measurements, yes, but there's also going to be modeling involved and what are, what are the uncertainties around that? Ownership of the credit. So I've generated this ecosystem credit, it's going to be sold, going to be transferred. Uh, ultimately, who owns that? Uh, what are my financial obligations and payments? Uh, and what are yours to me? What's the uncertainty in that? Uh, what's the variation in, in price that I might see over the duration of my contract? Uh, who owns my data? Are you using the data, the ag data transparent principles that have been developed? Uh, do you adhere to those? Uh, contractual noncompliance and acts of God. What happens if I have an extreme weather event? Uh, what happens if I have a string of, of bad years? Uh, am I going to... Uh, have to pay back? Am I going to get less payment? What, what happens in, the, in, uh, in those cases? And then lastly, what other relationships am I re required to have? Do I need to become a member? Uh, do I need to have a subscription? Do I need to be using certain tools or, or certain products uh, in order to participate in this carbon market program? Uh, or is it just the market program itself? Uh, so the principles of transparency, again, they're just a first step in this conversation. Uh, here are some of the others to address some of the challenges that I mentioned early on. Uh, first off, accounting systems. Each of the markets who are members of our group and all the markets in the space have their own ways of keeping track who's enrolled in their own programs. Uh, and they look at certain databases of who's enrolled in other programs. But uh, in many spaces, it's just a, a, a grower self-certification that I'm not participating in a conflicting program. Uh, and so there's a need for accounting systems to figure out which acres are enrolled in which programs uh, so that, again, these things can be more credible. There needs to be more scientific research, always needs to be more scientific research. But uh, as, um, as, as Dr. Cates will, will talk about, uh, the science of soils, of carbon sequestration in soils particularly, uh, is complex. It's hard to be sure about that measurement without a big range of uncertainty. Uh, and so we need to learn more about it. We need to improve the accuracy of our me measurement, modeling, reporting, and, and verification systems. Additionality and permanence, I mentioned those both, uh, both early on. Uh, additionality requirements, again, the requirement that, uh, that a program enables you to something that you wouldn't have done otherwise or you may not have been able to do otherwise, uh, 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 can seem to um, reduce the incentive for early adopters to continue doing what they already have been doing. And in some cases, market solutions aren't the only solution. So how do we meet the needs of, of early adopters and how do we wrap them into this system? Uh, permanence. Uh, again, uh, there are many ways to consider a carbon credit, and there are many ways to ratchet it down so that the carbon stays sequestered. Uh, but requiring carbon to be in, in the same patch of soil for 100 years uh, is pretty untenable in a cropped system. 
Uh, so what methods are we using in order to account for the, the variability, the annual variability of crop systems? Uh, and then lastly, how do your programs uh, uh, intersect with cost share programs, uh, policies and guidance uh, with the Climate Smart Commodity Program and with the upcoming Farm Bill? All of these are, are, are moving targets at the moment. All of them are layers of complexity. Uh, and uh, they're, they're clear needs for the Agricultural Climate Markets Collaborative as they continue their conversation. So that said, wanted to put this up on the screen. These are our principles for transparency. This is a dedicated site on the Keystone website. Uh, it will continue to evolve as the, as the conversation of the collaborative evolves. Uh, in addition to the principles themselves, we also have a section on the website that's focused on the actual questions that growers should ask when considering whether uh, or not to engage in a, in a carbon market or another kind of ecosystem services market. So uh, we look forward to having visitors to the website. We look forward to having, uh, and I look forward to having any questions coming out of this webinar. Uh, it's been a pleasure presenting to you today, uh, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much.